Brought to you by the creator of Bacano and Durarara, Dead Mountain Dead Play is a reverse isekai, and it's surprisingly well done. The story begins with a brutal showdown between the legendary hero, Shigura Lugrid, and the evil necromancer known as the Corpse Gun. Both of them have the same kind of powers, the evil eye. But while the hero used them to service the church and the people, the Corpse God used them for dominance. Or at least that's how the premise makes it out to be. Their battle continues and the hero seems to have the upper hand, when suddenly the Corpse God whips out a spell that the hero had never seen before. The man still plunges forward to land the finishing blow, and as for the Corpse God, what he did was reincarnation magic. That's why when the dust settles, he finds himself in a new and unfamiliar place. A place full of hustle, bustle, and people. For what it's worth, it's the modern day Shinjuku, located in Tokyo, Japan. The body he's in is that of a young white-haired boy, and it seems that the boy's throat had been cut, but Corpse God walks around casually nonetheless. He's a bit taken aback by all the flashy projections and, well, everything that comes with modern day Japan, but what really catches his eye is how peaceful this new land seems to be. Soon a couple of police officers check up on him and ask if what they're seeing on his neck is a design, because obviously no person could just casually walk around with their throat slit. He has trouble talking at first, but when his consciousness syncs up with his body's brain, he's able to respond to them in Japanese. His name is Polka Shinoyama, and he's right in the middle of getting some memories from his new body's brain. Suddenly a girl named Misaki pops up out of nowhere, she stomps on the police officer, and takes the boy back to that alley. She seems cheerful enough, and also seems happy that he's still alive. The corpse god thanks her for her concern, but she still prepares herself to kill him. Yeah, that's right, she's the one who killed the previous owner of that body. The memories of their previous encounter emerge in his head, so he flees. And so Misaki chases after him. Turns out, someone wants the boy dead, and she's just carrying out the job. She seems to be enjoying it, though. Anyway, the corpse god hides in an abandoned building. He realizes that this new body doesn't have a lot of stamina, and the same can be said about the magic power. He can't even heal the body's wound. Misaki soon arrives, but he barely manages to escape from her clutches again and enters an interesting room, where one of the Yakuza make people disappear. Here. She tells him that there are ghosts haunting this place, and he uses his evil lie to confirm this. Indeed, thanks to the ghosts, he can use his powers. He impales and kills Misaki almost instantly. Back in the other world, everyone rejoices now that the corpse god is no more! But the hero himself isn't very sure. As for the corpse god, he recalls his early days, how he was sold to the Empire and fought on the battlegrounds as a necromancer. That is, until the Empire fell, and he started searching for a place to live quietly. He was tired of everything. Finally, a relatable protagonist. Eventually, he met five youths and lived with them peacefully, but one day the soldiers killed the children. They did it while believing that they were saving them from the necromancer. This led the corpse god to enact vengeance upon them. Time continued to pass, and he realized that he's unable to die naturally. Someone has to kill him. And when the hero did that, he was able to perform reincarnation magic and move on. Back to the present, he realizes that Misaki is, well, actually dead. It takes him a moment to understand that there is no healing magic or recovery potions in this world. So before we move on a little bit about Misaki, her family was killed by a hitman, but ended up becoming one as well. It was for the purpose of revenge, and yes, she does get revenge by killing the hitman who killed her family. Family, but out of the fun of it, she also took the job of killing a seemingly innocent boy. Yep, that's Polka. She killed him, and was going to jump off a roof to end herself as well. But that's when she was told that Polka is still alive. Now the corpse god uses his magic to bring Misaki back. She'll be a zombie though. Others from the agency that hired Misaka also show up. They're going to dispose of her and also do something about Polka. It seems their leader is someone named Clarissa. He reveals the truth. But when she mentions how a nearby nursery is caught on fire, he leaves the conversation and acts. He uses his magic to get them out. The skeleton hands that save the children can then be seen all over social media. While the corpse god decides to start working for Clarissa as well, Misaki soon wakes up as a zombie. Now after the initial shock is over, Takumi and Misaki help the corpse god move into his new place. Yes, they were trying to kill him, but now everyone is on good terms. Clarissa has gifted him plenty of books about Earth and, well, modern society, so the corpse god speculates and realizes that there must be a connection between this world and its previous world, and that's why why the client who commissioned Clarissa's agency to kill Polka must know something. Since Clarissa has sworn to secrecy, he's on his way to find out more about the client that wants him dead. 
Later, someone shows up to ask for the agency's help, but it turns out to be an ambush. When Misaki is driven into a corner and jumped on by multiple men, she manages to defeat them all. But he shoots her when she drops her guard. Obviously, being a zombie, she revives. Because nobody expects a human to be able to beat Jesus' respawn time, the officers are pretty shocked. The corpse god also enters the chat. He notices souls of infants haunting the man and gets visibly angry. The man uses his skeletal hands to mold their bodies into a human knot. No mercy whatsoever. The ones who manage to escape are also killed by another mysterious troublemaker named Lemmings. Following this, Takumi wonders about the corpse god's values. He doesn't sound all that evil to them, and then together with Misaki, the three of them get themselves some pizza. They talk about Misaki being a zombie, and the corpse god mentions that this world and his world are definitely connected. Elsewhere, Clarissa is having some good old late night fun with the girls when she gets a call from a client. It's the person who commissioned her to kill Polka. She tells the client exactly how it is. Polka is not the mere high schooler the client made him out to be, and that's why their business relationship is on hold. The client seemed quite unhappy about this development. The police eventually arrive at the ambush site to see what happened as there were reports of gunshots. Luckily, Lemmings punches and breaks the human knot beforehand to spare them the PTSD, I guess. That would definitely haunt my nightmares for the rest of my life. Clarissa also runs a bar together with her agency, and it seems there's some kind of commotion going on here. The guy had no idea that one beer would cost him 60,000 yen, and now he's at the mercy of three bouncers, but he easily knocks them out. Meanwhile, inside the bar, a guy named Tsubaki is talking to the bartender. He wants to know more about the fire that had broken out. That's why he came here to see Clarissa, but she's not here, and he can't wait because there's another call for duty. He heads to the scene together with the other guy and witnesses the human knot. Following this, Tsubaki, who's actually the manager of the comms three crew, starts talking to everyone about the troublemakers. The fire-breathing bug and lemmings are bad enough. Yes, but considering those skeletal hands that made it onto social media and now this human not, they have a third troublemaker that needs to be put under cuffs. The Grim Reaper. Or should I say our little corpse god. But it doesn't matter who it is, because Tsubaki knows for a fact that since these troublemakers are human, he and his team can handle them. Subsequently, the corpse god himself is playing around with his soul-swapping magic. He even moves the real Polka's soul into a stuffed shark toy. Yes, the actual Polka is still relevant. When Misuki enters the room, she can't keep herself from hugging the cute shark. She didn't know that it was the real Polka. Back to the important business. The corpse god talks about how they can use mana stones, basically jewelry to get enough magic. But when they go see them at a jewelry store, the corpse god actually sheds tears, because these prices are nothing short of insanity. Back where he's from, even a kid could buy a mana stone. Remember the guy who beat those three bouncers senselessly? He's Detective Arase, and he causes trouble for our gang by snatching Takumi's drone, which was in the air. Keep in mind that Takumi operates from his computer room. The corpse god casually snatches the drone back and also defends his friend Takumi when Arase openly insults him. Misuki sends him flying with a kick, and they leave the scene. At the bar, Tsubaki shows up again, but this time talks to Clarissa and asks her about all this mysterious supernatural stuff. He wants to know if she has something to do with it. Misaki and the corpse god arrive at the bar just as Tsubaki receives a message from Detective Arase. He immediately realizes that the description given to him by Arase matches those of the two who just entered the bar. And Arase also shows up. They were going to interrogate Misaki and Arase when the lights went off. The corpse god notices something on the ceiling. Carissa lights a candle, and it's revealed that the person hanging from the ceiling is none other than Troublemaker, the most wanted criminal in the entire country, the guy named Lemmings. Misaki tells the corpse god that Lemmings is a lot more terrifying than the officers, and he agrees. He can already see that with his evil eye. The cops try to apprehend Lemmings, but they're no match. Arase then engages with him in combat, and the entire bar starts getting destroyed. Though Lemmings didn't see Arase as a threat, he just spots Misuki, picks her up, and tries to flee. Corpse God wants to save her, but if he uses magic, the detectives will never let him live a peaceful life. He compares Lemmings to the hero, someone who has pushed well beyond the limits of a human. As the lights are further dimmed, the corpse god uses his magic to face off against Lemmings. He frees Misaki, but their battle destroys the entire place. By the time the lights come back on, Lemmings has gotten away. We see him informing his employer, Takiro Shinoyama, that Polka is indeed still alive. 
The next day, Takumi, Misuki, and the Corpse God talk about money. Looks like the Corpse God has decided that it's time to run a business. A fortune-telling business, that is. Takumi will use his computer knowledge to hack and get a client's personal information, and the Corpse God will use that info along with his evil eye to surprise the client. It's foolproof. It doesn't take long for them to earn a lot of money. They share it evenly, but Polka, who is now a stuffed shark, denies it because he feels he didn't earn it. And soon, just when you would wonder who exactly Polka is, a pair of twins, his niece and nephew, enter the room. This is going to make things complicated, but after the corpse god notices a disturbed spirit behind them, he gives them a hug and tells them that he will come to the family house. It's revealed that Polka is the second son of the Shinoyama clan. Since his father is going to die soon, they're trying to kill him in order to make sure he doesn't get his share of the inheritance. We then see Polka's father smiling at the news that his son is still alive. Corpse God goes to the Shinoyama estate together with Misaki. The twins welcome them inside. Takiro Shinoyama is also with them. They all eat inside together. Takiro Shinoyama is the eldest son of Polka's brother, and as Takumi told the Corpse God before, he's just as shady as he appears to be. He is responsible for the clan's dirty work, after all. Takiro has four other siblings, including the twins, but their sister, Suzuka, is unfortunately dead. They all converse during the lunch, Misaki surprisingly well at communicating as the Corpse God notes, and soon, the current head of the family, Polka's father, Rozan Shinoyama, shows up. He wants to talk to his son alone, and when they're in his room, he surprisingly asks the Corpse God just who he is exactly. Yeah, he might be old, but you can tell that that's not his son. The Corpse God doesn't reveal his true identity, but he affirms the man's words and mentions that Polka is alive and well. Then suddenly the Corpse God has to leave because the twins are in danger. It turns out that a hitman has been hired to kill them, and as for the disturbed spirit around them, it's that of their older sister, Suzuka. Misaki protects them from the hitman, who can control fire for some reason, and soon just as some debris was about to fall into the twins, the Corpse God arrives. He protects them using his skeletal hands and reassures Suzuka that their future is safe. Suzuka Suzuka's spirit calms herself and hugs the twins. Now that the twins are safe, Takiro realizes that it's time to do some cleanup. His subordinate goes to get Rozan's nephew-in-law, the man who hired the arsonist hitman to kill the twins. The hitman himself was trying to escape. He had even taken the guise of a maid, but you can't escape the evil eye now, can you? There was nowhere left for him to escape. Lemming shows up out of nowhere, pins him down, and asks both Corpse God and Misaki to not mention his name. Takiro takes his time with nephew-in-law who was behind this. Yes, Lemmings is working for Takiro, and there also seems to be a woman by his side, someone who's giving off the same vibe as Lemmings. Later on, as the hitman is being taken away in a police car, it's revealed that he's not the firebending troublemaker. He's a fraud. A hack. By the time the police realize this, the imposter has already been lit on fire. They got out of the car right before it blows up. As for the actual fire-breathing troublemaker, she's a woman. We see her singing a children's song on an overhead bridge right before the episode ends. Polka's father, Rozan, talks to Corpse God and Misaki in his room. Corpse God asks him to dismiss his bodyguards who were hiding, which he does as well. Next, he explains what happened. He explains that he's someone from another world who was reincarnated in Polka's corpse after Misaki killed him. Rozan believes them and then brings out his sword in front of Misaki. Well, she is the one who killed his son. But Misaki remains calm and composed. She reveals that although Rozan wouldn't be wrong in killing her, she isn't afraid of him because he's a good person. The real Polka, who's currently inside the body of a shark plushie, pops up and tries to stop his father from pointing his sword at Misaki. This makes him realize that the shark is actually his son because something similar has happened in the past where he protected a crocodile from him. Rozan laughs it off though. He literally laughs off the fact that his son is now a shark plushie. God, I wish I could live that nonchalantly. Corpse God explains that he'll need some other vessel before he can give Polka his body back. To this, Rosen tells him that he should try their company's androids. But instead of the Corpse God, the one who really wants to be an android is Polka. Rosen doesn't mind because Polka is safer this way. After all, the one using his son's body is the Corpse God. He knows that there are many who want his son dead. There could even be a family member among them. Moving on, Misaki apologizes to Polka for murdering him, which sounds weirder than it actually is, but Polka's casual about it. He doesn't hate her at all. Now, while they're bidding the kids farewell, Misaki wonders if the corpse god wants to form a contract with Suzuka, who is the elder sister of his kids. But it looks like that's not his plan. 
Okay, so Comps3 enters the chat again. They're talking about a troublemaker named Phantom Solitaire. He's someone who hasn't actually killed or hurt someone, but he has messed up the stock market and the reputation of Japanese security. He's someone who uses supernatural abilities disguised as magic tricks. Back to the gang, Corpse God shows off his 2000 yen antique radio to Takumi and then tunes in to a news channel. The news talks about the death of an arsonist, and yes, it's the same one that attacked the Shinoyama state, and then the next news is about Tena Shidomura. He is the Phantom Solitaire. The news anchor reporting on Solitaire's prison breakout has a pretty flashy mustache. Keep that in mind, guys, this will be on the test tomorrow. Takumi explains to Corpse God and Hosorogi about who exactly Solitaire is. Hosorogi here is a spirit that possesses Misaki's mechanical pencil. As for Misaki, she wonders why the news anchor's voice suddenly changed from a woman's to a man's. The news anchor himself removes his sunglasses and declares that he will resume performing a week from now. You guessed it, the anchor talking about Solitaire turns out to be Solitaire himself. He jacked the airwaves, which is why his face on screen changes to that of another anchor. Soyashi Niyoma Polka's niece pulls up at an abandoned building and starts calling Misaki and Takumi her new housemates. Her attendant, Zhao Yu, is present as well and looks like he isn't very sure what's going on either. Corpse God asks her what's up. She says something vague. Luckily, Zhao Yu elaborates that her bedroom and shark memorabilia collected were wrecked because of the fire. He also plays a recording of Rosen, which tells Polka to take Saoyo and her attendant for now. His reasoning is that if two Shinoyama are in the building, he will have a convenient reason to deploy security. But Corpse God wonders, what if the Shinoyama who's trying to kill Polka is Seiyo? Well, that would be pretty convenient. Iwanome and Arase visit the Shinoyama state to question the twins about the arsonist. It's clear that the twins aren't very fond of them, but whatever. They've actually come to question Takadu. So when Takadu and his bodyguards are in a private room with them, Iwanome mentions that the suspect in that arson attack is the fire-breathing bug. But if that's true, then that means that there would be no more of the fire-breathing bug's crime. That's what Takadu says, but Iwanome gives no guarantee. This causes Takadu to play the victim and state how anxious he's been ever since. He's upset at them for Solitaire as well, because when Solitaire kidnapped the Prime Minister, their company's stocks went down. When Iwanome and Arase leave, Arase says that Takadu's bodyguards are definitely killers, so they decide to keep a watch on them. Though, for the time being, they do have a lead. Iwanome shows Arase the Shinoyama family photograph, and Arase instantly recognizes Polka. That's their lead. They now know that the teenager from the alley is Rosen's son. Plus, someone associated with Polka was also present at the human knot scene. Meanwhile, Takadu realizes that his grandpa, Rosen, is making his own moves. But for the time being, he's counting on Iwanome to uncover Polka's secrets. Seriously, when did the show turn into 4D chess? Back to the gang, they give Seiyo and Zhao Yu an empty room and also bring a mattress. When they leave, we learn that Zhao Yu has put a microphone, which is now capturing whatever Polka and the others are talking about, downstairs. It seems he's not the pleasant guy we thought he was. He listens to them talk about Corpse God's previous life, but of course he thinks they're just talking about a game. Anyway, whatever it is, Zhao Yu plans on exposing Polka for being an imposter. Subsequently, we see Phantom Solitaire just walking around in public before being chased by the police. Now, Iwanome and Arase arrive just as the Corpse God and everyone decides to reopen their fortune-telling business. They're also here to learn more about the fortune-telling business itself. Cool. The Corpse God, who in their eyes is Polka, does fortune-telling for Iwanome. He talks about all sorts of information about Iwanome, but the guy isn't too impressed because Takumi could have easily given that information to him. However, when the Corpse God talks to him about the man's unhealed injury from the past, he gets his attention. He lashes out and asks why he knows something like that, but of course, the Corpse God is doing what he's supposed to do. He's talking about the client's past. Later, the fire-breathing bug strikes again when someone is trying to get his hands on a certain document, but before the document also burns, Solitaire shows up and takes it. So, for the sake of context, the Corpse God saw this document in Iwanome's past. Iwanome goes to the bar to talk to Clarissa. He wants to know about her connection to Polka. Zhao Yu is listening in on their conversation. However, Clarissa is easily able to take herself out of it. She states that all she's done is rent him a building. She is networking with someone from the Shinoyama group. As for our gang, Hosorogi, the spirit in the pen, reveals that he used to be Iwanome's superior. The world is a small place indeed, but he charges Corpse God and the others money if they want to know more. Solitaire, on the other hand, discusses the symbol drawn on the document with someone in the Tokyo Detention Center. As for the symbol, on the day of the Solitaire performance, the Corpse God sees it on a blimp in the morning and is left stunned. 
It's the emblem of the fallen empire from his old world. Iwanome and Arase realize that this symbol, the Solitaire case, and the Hosoragi case are all connected. Solitaire himself is casually reading manga on top of the blimp without a care in the world when he ends up getting shot by a sniper. The sniper is also surprised that they managed to hit him. But as it turns out, it was just a dummy. The real Solitaire is on the news talking about how the police made an attempt on his life and how it's because of the symbol on the blimp. So what's the conspiracy here? That's the question he asks everyone through the TV. If anyone can give him an answer, he'll give them 300 million yen. Now, Seiyo ends up hearing them talk about the other empire and reincarnation, so he asks what's up, and in reply, the corpse god just tells him everything, and she believes him. In fact, she takes the real polka and goes to the washroom. Remember guys, this girl loves sharks and wants to be one. Misaki ends up also joining Soyo in the shower. She messes with her by saying that she's the one who killed Polka, but Seo doesn't care. She knows that Polka must have already forgiven her. And after all that fan service, we learn that the reason Polka was blessed with a scene of Seo and Misaki showering is because Seo wants to exchange bodies with him. She literally just wants to be a shark plushie. Of course, our little Polka is blushing so hard that the blue shark plushie is also turning red. Moving on, the corpse god doesn't want anyone else defiling the emblem, so he decides to meet Phantom Solitaire. With that, Solitaire is informed about the fortune telling. Takumi tells the corpse god that while he couldn't find anything about the symbol, he knows that it is connected to the house of Hosoragi's murder. Hosoragi immediately confirms this. He was killed by assassins because of that symbol. But why? Next, there's a fortune-telling session. Solitaire has disguised himself as a random adult. This is for the purpose of making sure that the fortune-teller isn't a fraud. The corpse god tells him that he better start changing his ways. He sighs because all the fortune-teller is doing is revealing the information of the person he's disguised as. It seems the fortune-teller really is a phony, because if he was real, he would have realized it's Solitaire. Anyway, he still asks about the symbol, and for some reason, the corpse god gives it away, and that he is indeed the real deal. He replies by drawing the correct symbol. To be fair, he just did that because the symbol Solitaire tried to draw with his fingers was wrong, and he instinctively felt the need to correct him. Solitaire decides to leave for the time being, when the corpse god surprises him again by talking about the spirit of a girl in a wheelchair behind him. He states that he can help her pass on, but Solitaire excuses himself after saying that she must be his guardian spirit. When he leaves the room, he sees a girl wearing a raincoat that says Fire Breathing Bug, and it's revealed that she also asked the corpse god about the symbol. There's a lot going on with Iwanome, Arase, and the police higher-ups, and then you have Solitaire trying to enter the building through the rooftop. He's immediately attacked, and he thinks it's Polka, but no, it's not Polka. Both Polka and the corpse god are fast asleep. It's Xiao Yu. Anyway, the real Polka soon wakes up and sees glowing writing on the wall, which seems to be from the fire-breathing bug. We're also shown a short flashback through the corpse god's dream when he wanted to save the Empire from its downfall. He even asked his beautiful master about it, but in the end, he was unable to do anything and was branded as the enemy of the Empire and loses everything. Polka wakes up the corpse god to show him the writing on the wall. It says that the world is a buggy program. So is he a termite or a bird eating the bug? Next, he receives a call from an unknown number. He asks if Polka is also a bastard child of Sabaramun, and this just leaves Corpse God stunned. Just how the hell does he know that name? Meanwhile, Solitaire and Zhao Yu are in the middle of a pretty cool battle. Zhao Yu plans on taking his time interrogating him after he catches the guy, while Solitaire tells him that it's 3 a.m. Zhao Yu is way past his bedtime, but Zhao Yu surprises him, and even those of us who are watching from behind the screen, by revealing that he is in fact 19 years old. Solitaire keeps getting overwhelmed by Zhao Yu's speed and battle antics. Now, the battle is being observed by someone who's reporting it to Takedu, and then there's also Lemmings who is observing the fight from another rooftop. Moving on, the girl in the fire-breathing bug raincoat seems to be talking to the man on the phone, yet the one who asked if he's the bastard child of Sabaramund. This causes the corpse god to use his eyes to scout the area. He wants to know the location of the caller. Back to the fight, Zhao Yu wonders about Solitaire's relationship with Polka, and out of curiosity, he also asks if Solitaire was involved in Hosorogi's death. But right then, as he plunges towards Solitaire, Lemmings lands between them. He faces Solitaire, which gives Zhao Yu the opportunity to attack him, but he ignores him. He's not going to hurt Xiao Yu because Takaru says so. Instead, he's after Solitaire. In the streets, two policemen ask the girl in the raincoat what she's doing. 
She looks sus after all, and sure enough, she ends the call. This annoys the corpse god, the caller and the girl are messing with him. So he activates his powers, and even though the others can't see it, they can feel it. The girl says that she was looking for her dog. A man then comes up and goes with him after saying that it's her father. But the corpse god knows that there are no dogs nearby, so he keeps tracking them. He also heads to the roof to help Xiao Yu as the situation is complicated, but he uses his invisible hands so as to not draw any attention to himself. The hands still aren't enough to keep a hold of lemmings. The corpse god takes things to the next level, which gives the hands a tangible form, but he still couldn't catch lemmings, so he goes after Solitaire instead. Well, Solitaire's entire career is just him bailing at the right moment, so of course he gets away as well. The girl in the raincoat is captured at last, but the real juicy part is how the footage of Corpse God's hands is captured. It goes viral on the internet, and as you can expect, people are coming up with wild theories. They're connecting it to the skeleton incident from episode 1. One of the people viewing all the viral tweets is someone who was involved in Hosoroki's death. He seeks this power and states that they can kill multiple birds with just this one stone. He also reveals the irony that this exact building is where they disposed of Hosoroki. Subsequently, Iwanome tells this guy to secure the scene. Clarissa is informed by a female bouncer that the police are on the move, while Misaki wakes up and then falls asleep yet again. She slept through this entire hectic night. The anime ends with a brother and sister talking about the footage that's being shown on the television. The brother says that things are getting interesting, while the sister gradually smiles. Her smile reveals a set of fangs. So what do you guys think of all this? The way I see it, this story has only just begun. Well, the second season will be coming out this fall, so if you haven't watched the actual anime yet, I would highly recommend it. This is just one of those animes where you have to properly absorb the story to understand what's going on, and that's the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you saw, subscribe to the channel. I'll be uploading a lot of videos just like this, so I'll see you at the next one.